Biloxivir is an antiviral drug developed by Shionogi in Japan. It received FDA approval in 2018, and you can see it's almost certainly related to one of their earlier antiviral drugs, Dolutegravir. I'm mentioning this now because they both probably share a key intermediate. Uh, the details of the synthesis are buried in the Japanese patent literature, but fortunately there was a very nice article recently published in OPR and D that disentangles a lot of their synthetic roots. So that's what I've been working from to make this video, and I'll post a link to that in the description. So this is actually a fairly intimidating looking molecule. It weighs over 500 Daltons, it's got six rings in it, and structurally very complex. But thinking retrosynthetically, the first thing we can do is disconnect it across the middle and split it into two more fragments which start to look a bit more reasonable in terms of thinking about how to make them. And this, uh, this methyl carbonate is added at a very late stage on the synthesis after deproduction of the benzyl ether. This serves to render the molecule as a prodrug and in vivo this part falls off and reveals the active compound which is the free hydroxy group. That's actually the marboxyl part. It's not immediately obvious how to make this dibenzothiopane building block, but thinking retrosynthetically, if this hydroxy group can be derived from a carbonyl, that enables us to do a Friedel-Craft disconnection and get back to a carboxylic acid, and this aryl benzyl thioether starts to look a bit more tractable. So now for the forward synthesis, the starting material was this difluorobenzoic acid. Treatment with LDA affords the aryl lithium via directed ortholithiation, and then reaction of the aryl lithium with dimethylformamide after workup affords the benzaldehyde. And of course that doesn't sit in that form with an acid on the next carbon over, it snaps shut into this lactol form. And then the lactol can be treated with camphor sulfonic acid. That causes protonation of the hydroxy group, and then it can be ejected by the neighbouring oxygen to form this oxonium intermediate. And then the oxonium can capture the thiophenol, and now we've installed the sulphur. The next step is an ionic reduction, so treatment of this compound with aluminium trichloride. That strong Lewis acid will coordinate to the carbonyl and cause some of the molecule to exist in this ring-opened cationic form. And then it's an ionic silane-type reduction of the carbocation. The reagent of choice for Shionogi was tetramethyl disiloxane, and this has the same reactivity as something more commonly encountered like triethylsilane, but it's a bulk chemical which is available in large quantities because it's used in the manufacture of silicone polymers. And so this has now reduced us to a benzyl aryl thioether, and we're ready to do the Friedel-Craft step. This compound was heated up with polyphosphoric acid, that's a very strong dehydrating agent, so it will convert the OH of the carboxylate into some sort of phosphorus-based leaving group. And then the electrons can be pulled out of this benzene ring to form the seven-membered thiopane. And then the final step was reduction with sodium borohydride to afford the first building block that I mentioned in the earlier slides. So now let's think about the other half of the molecule, and retrosynthetically we can divide it into three main fragments. Uh, the right-hand ring is a morpholine, and that was ultimately derived from this lactam building block. I'm not going to go into the steps to make this intermediate because they're not particularly interesting, but the feature to note is this allyl oxycarbonyl protecting group on the nitrogen. That'll become important for a later step. Uh, synthetically, it's not so easy to make a nitrogen-nitrogen bond, so we'd better bring that in as some hydrazine derivative, and indeed Chianogi used Bach hydrazine for that part of the molecule. And then on the left, there's this other ring. Now, in the root um, for Beloxivir, the starting material was this benzyl-protected ethyl ester, but that's not obvious where it comes from. Um, but if you look at the root for Dolutegravir, uh, this material is a common intermediate, and that was derived from maltol, which is a commodity chemical, and among other places it can be obtained from fir trees, and it derives its name from malted barley, which it's also present in. So on to the forward synthesis now. The first step is a protection of the free hydroxy group as the benzyl ether. This ring system is a 4 pyrone, and whilst you might think it's aromatic because it does have six electrons in, uh, the aromaticity is actually very weak, and the behaviour of these molecules is better described as a diene, or like a pair of alpha-beta unsaturated ketones. And so treatment of LDA can enable the deprotonation of the exocyclic methyl group and the formation of an extended enolate, and the extended enolate can pick up benzaldehyde to form this product here. Uh, the hydroxy group can be converted to a leaving group with mesyl chloride and eliminated with DBU to form an alkene product. And it looks like we're heading in the wrong direction because, of course, we want a, an acid at this position. Um, but the next step is quite a neat way to get that acid. The compound was treated with a mixture of ruthenium trichloride and sodium periodate. And what's happening in situ here? The periodate oxidizes the ruthenium all the way up to ruthenium-8, ruthenium tetroxide, and that's a highly reactive compound which behaves analogously to osmium tetroxide, so we can do a dihydroxylation of the double bond. 
Of course, the ruthenate ester is broken down under the reaction conditions, but remember we also have the sodium periodate, and so uh, that can do the standard periodate visinal diol cleavage mechanism and give us a pair of aldehydes. And then having obtained the aldehyde, uh, the aldehyde was oxidized to the carboxylate using tempo and bleach, and then the carboxylate was converted to the ethyl ester uh, using an alkylative route, so ethyl iodide, and this because, is because I imagine that the ring is probably a bit too flimsy to survive being heated with acid like you do in a normal fissure esterification. Uh, the next step is to swap out the oxygen for the nitrogen, so this is where the Bach hydrazine comes in, um, the nitrogen will add in at this position, so remember I said these react like alpha beta unsaturated ketones, and when the oxygen pushes the electrons back down, the ring can break open because it never really had that strong an aromaticity to begin with, and so this oxygen will leave as the uh, the enolate effectively, and that'll pick up the proton that we just lost from the Bach hydrazine and form a carbonyl here. And this looks a little bit something like an intermediate from the Hanch pyridine synthesis, and it behaves basically the same. There'll have to be a, a rotation or isomerization of this bond at some point, but then the nitrogen can attack into that carbonyl and loss of water forms the enamine on the other side and that completes the uh, reformation of the ring. We've swapped out an oxygen for a nitrogen and now this nitrogen containing ring is a bit more robust so it can survive hydrochloric acid treatment to remove the Bach group and reveal this amine. And so the next step is to join this compound with the morpholine that I mentioned earlier. And so this hemiaminal was treated with the highly Lewis acidic tin tetrachloride, and that tears off the methoxy group and generates this iminium intermediate, and that captures the hydrazine nitrogen and joins these two fragments together. The next step is where the allyl oxycarbonyl group comes into play. And these are interesting because when you treat them with palladium, they ionize. This is essentially a, a suji trost type reactivity, so the oxygen leaves. You don't get a carbamate leaving group because that would be unstable, so it decomposes further with loss of CO2, and the leaving group is this nitrogen anion. Now, normally this would just quench if we had protons available, but we're in a dry solvent system of THF and morpholine, and so instead this attacks the nearby ester, and with the loss of ethanol, that forms the central ring of our compound. And that's actually the building block I mentioned earlier, just drawn in a slightly different orientation, with the added consideration, of course, that we need an enantiopure building block for the enantiopure drug. So Shionogi had to work out a way to resolve this and get the desired enantiomer from the reaction. And the way they accomplished this was by coupling their racemic product with an enantiopure carboxylate, in this case tetrahydrofuran carboxylic acid, and this gives them a pair of diastereomers, and on a fairly large scale these were separable by differential crystallization, and then the auxiliary can be removed by hydrolysis with DBU and ethanol to afford the enantiopure building block. I'll just briefly mention what is called the second generation route in the OPR and D paper, so starting from the Bach protected methyl ester this time, an alternative method that they devised uh, was to combine this building block with this aliphatic amine here. And the amine was derived from thalamido protected 2 aminoethanol and the dimethyl acetal of bromoacetaldehyde. So bromoacetaldehyde itself is no good to handle, it's very reactive, it likes to polymerize, it's a terrible lacrimator and so on. Uh, but the dimethyl acetals and ethyl acetals are readily available and they serve as a useful masked aldehyde equivalent. And so anyway, these two are joined together in just a simple ether synthesis. And then the amine was reacted with the methyl ester to form the amide product. And so then this intermediate was treated with methane sulfonic acid in water acetonitrile. And with in situ deprotection of the Bach group, uh, the whole thing zips up and you get two new rings formed and everything takes place in one step. I'm not going to draw the mechanism out because it would take far too long, but you might like to have a think about how that works. And so with these two advanced building blocks in hand, Shionogi's final task was to couple them together. And the reagent of choice for this transformation was T3P. You'll sometimes see this called PPAA, or propyl phosphonic acid anhydride. I've drawn out the structure here. Essentially, this is just a very good, mild dehydrating agent, so it can be used to activate carboxylates for amide couplings, things like that. And almost certainly what's happening in this reaction is it's converting the hydroxy group to a leaving group and that'll float away and give us a benzylically stabilized cation which then captures the nitrogen of the other reacting partner. 
and that completes the synthesis, uh, at least to the benzyl protected stage. Uh, they chose an interesting way to do the benzyl deprotection. For whatever reason, hydrogenolysis was no good, so they did a nucleophilic deprotection with lithium chloride. And then the final step was to install this prodrug part of the molecule by reaction with chloromethyl methyl carbonate using a bit of potassium iodide, presumably to make the SN2 go a bit better. And that completes Shionogi's synthesis of biloxivir marboxyl. Um, there's a fair amount of more detail in the OPR and D paper that I haven't covered. So, for example, the exact choice of protecting group here is important. So if you want some more details about the story, that's where to look.